You can stop smoking without any sort of supernatural intervention. No, not really. If you give people magic mushrooms, psilocybin, and they have a mystical experience, they have about an 85% chance of smoking cessation sure, with but... one treatment. However, this trial utilized controlled doses of psilocybin in conjunction with regular cognitive behavioral therapy sessions, both administered multiple times for over eight weeks. The transgender suicide rate is 40%. According to the Anderson School at UCLA, it makes no difference. They, there's a study that came out last year. It makes no difference as to whether people recognize you as a transgender person. The study he cites, suicide attempts among transgender and gender non-conforming adults, does find that 41% of trans people attempt suicide. This is debunked in literally the very first page of the study he cites, which finds that trans people who experienced rejection, discrimination, harassment, or social isolation had a significantly higher prevalence of suicide rates than those who did not report experiencing those things. Literally, this is in the summary on the very first page. There is no way you could have missed it. The amount of them that I've met that have told me either directly or in a roundabout way that's very clear um, that they don't believe everything that they say that they believe when they're on camera. You know what this person told me? They told me plant fake protesters outside of your event. Not only that, they said make fake signs because you're probably gonna get protesters, but you wanna amp the numbers. And it made me sick because clearly this person has done that. And this is someone who, although is hated by many, is also loved by many. And the many who love him believe that all those people were real. And obviously all doesn't mean literally all. There's two or three good ones, but the overwhelming majority and those people that you guys know are just liars. Remember when conservatives used to be decent and honest? I don't. Conservatives are lying bastards. They've always been lying bastards. Why are they lying bastards? Part 1. The Philosophy of Lying In The Republic, Plato describes democracy as a system where people are free. There is liberty and freedom of speech plenty, and every individual is free to do as he likes. And then he says, "Fuck that. Plato didn't like democracy. Perhaps understandably, since it was under Athenian democracy where a group of jurors voted to have his friend Socrates poisoned to death with hemlock. His argument was that it was essentially a mob rule, the sum of individuals consumed by unnecessary desires. Desires which could then be exploited by leaders with false and braggart words and opinions. He argued that democracies would elevate narcissistic demagogues into power and ultimately descend into tyranny. Hmm. His solution was to outline a utopian society run by the only people Plato thought could ever truly know what was good. Conveniently enough, these were philosophers. The philosopher kings, or guardians as he called them, would rule the city with the soldiers in the middle and the workers at the bottom. He also proposed that all the brightest philosophers in Athens should get together and have orgies. That way they could produce a generation of genetically superior guardians who didn't belong to any family but to the guardian class as a whole. Now Plato knew this would be a hard sell, especially to people living in a democracy, so he came up with the idea of earning people's consent by telling them one single noble lie. The lie was that class divisions existed because the gods had infused people's souls with metal. The guardians were infused with gold, the soldiers with silver, and the workers with bronze and iron. This was the myth of the metals. And if that's not weird enough, there is even a section in the Republic where they talk about censoring and rewriting pieces of poetry and literature that contradicted it. But far from being the irrelevant ramblings of an arrogant old philosopher, the idea of the noble lie can be seen again and again as a recurring theme in conservative thought. The 18th century conservative philosopher Edmund Burke made the case for what he called pleasing illusions. He argued that societies were held together by a fabric of shared values and customs, things like manners, honour and chivalry. In his book Reflections on the Revolution in France, Burke made a broad objection to the Enlightenment and wrote with a sense of regret and nostalgia all the pleasing illusions which made power gentle and obedience liberal, which harmonized the different shades of life and which, by a bland assimilation, incorporated into politics the sentiments which beautify and soften private society, 
are to be dissolved by this new conquering empire of light and reason. For Burke, these illusions were the cultural glue that held society together. Nation states on their own are cold, bureaucratic, and violent. The only way they could achieve social cohesion was by charming people with tradition and symbolism. His justification for the immense wealth of the monarchy was that they functioned as an aesthetic representation of the laws and institutions of a nation, so as to create in us love, veneration, admiration, or attachment. This is quite similar to the way conservatives approached modern nationalism. Intelligent conservatives, and there are a few, don't genuinely believe that there's anything intrinsically divine or special about their nation. They see nationalism as a suspension of disbelief that beautifies society and strengthens social harmony. As Burke says, to make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely. Burke does differ from Plato here because he doesn't see this as a lie that is imposed from the top down. He saw it as a shared sense of the way people genuinely saw the world. It's only when these pesky ideas like liberty, equality and fraternity come in that they start to look like deceptions. Once people started to poke holes in these illusions, Burke warned that we risk becoming a nation of gross, stupid, ferocious, and at the same time poor and sordid barbarians. Could this be why conservatives are always so sensitive around topics like statues or the national anthem or colonial history? Maybe. But I think I'll defer that one to the comment section. Part 2. Clean your room with your bootstraps. The economist, Friedrich von Hayek, came to prominence in the 1970s with his scathing critiques of socialism and collectivism, things he noted for their extraordinary similarity in many respects with the conditions under fascism. <laughs> Hayek instead argued for an economy of free markets with limited interference from governments or trade unions. His ideas largely influenced the policies of figures like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. Thatcher famously carried around pages that she had torn out of Hayek's books in her handbag. I mean, that's just kind of adorable. But underlying Hayek's economic vision, there was also a distinct philosophy. Personal responsibility. As Thatcher said, economics are the method. The object is to change the soul. The idea was that free market capitalism was fundamentally fair. It rewarded intelligence and hard work, whilst punishing stupidity and laziness. If you were rich, it was because you earned it, and if you were poor, same. Thatcher once described poverty as a personality defect, a sort of you problem, and the idea of personal responsibility has been at the center of conservative thought ever since. The problem is, Hayek didn't believe it. At several points, he acknowledges that in the free market, the results and outcomes of our actions are largely unknown. He admits that success, when it isn't straight up inherited, is largely down to luck. In 1976, he wrote, It is a real dilemma to what extent we ought to encourage in the young the belief that when they really try, they will succeed, or should rather emphasize that inevitably, some unworthy will succeed, and some worthy will fail. Whether we allow the views of those groups to prevail with whom the overconfidence and the appropriate reward of the able and industrious is strong, and who in consequence will do much that benefits the rest, and whether without such partly erroneous beliefs, the large numbers will tolerate actual differences and rewards, which will be based partly on achievement and partly on mere chance. So what's he saying here? Well, he's saying that people are not fully responsible for their own success or failure, but that it's better if they think they are. Because one, it'll make them work harder. And two, if the people who fail are blaming themselves, they won't be blaming the system. Meaning the people on top will be safe from discord and rebellion. For Hayek, personal responsibility is a noble lie. Part three, Batman. The Dark Knight is a film about a billionaire who tries to remedy his father's systematic dismantling of vital social safety nets by buying a shit ton of gadgets, and illegally kicking fuck out of criminals. It's basically a conservative fantasy about a nutbag of a hero who has clearly missed the memo that we do in fact live in a society. But The Dark Knight does also contain a more subtle piece of conservative wisdom, one which I didn't notice myself and had to instead be shown by this fuzzy ashtray of a man who's much better at philosophy than I am. 
In his film, The Pervert's Guide to Cinema, Slavoj Žižek notes three points in the film. First, when Harvey Dent gets himself arrested by pretending to be Batman. Second, when Commissioner Gordon fakes his death. And third, when Batman insists on pinning Harvey Dent's murderous rampage on the Joker, meaningfully convincing the Commissioner, after Dent held a gun to his family, that whitewashing five murders was necessary because Gotham needs a true hero. The subtext here is that we have a billionaire, a politician, and the police commissioner, the holy trinity of capitalist power, agreeing to a series of noble lies. Batman is conservative propaganda. Part 4. Putin's Russia. It was 2014. EDM was a thing. In that year, Adam Curtis released a short documentary on how modern-day Russia utilizes deception in such a bizarre way that it is literally theater. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union saw an explosion of avant-garde and postmodern art. One of the people who emerged out of this scene was the theater director Vladislav Surkov. Surkov worked as a PR man in the 90s for one of the Russian oligarchs, before switching over to work for Putin in 1999. His job was to use what he had learned from the arts to manipulate the public. He was in charge of PR for Putin's party, United Russia, but on top of that, he also used Kremlin money to fund and influence groups that were opposed to Putin. His goal was to infect the political discourse with a deliberate sense of absurdness and incoherence. He created his own oppositional youth group, which claimed to be anti-fascist, but then members would often compare themselves to the Hitler Youth, and were even allegedly used to beat up journalists. How do we know all this? Because Surkov himself made it public knowledge. The result is that Russian politics has become a piece of absurdist theatre. As a Russian journalist put it, Surkov is at the centre of the show, sponsoring nationalist skinheads one moment, backing human rights groups the next. It's a strategy of power based on keeping any opposition there may be constantly confused. A ceaseless shape-shifting that is unstoppable because it is indefinable. In the 1990s, the attempt to bring Western capitalism and democracy to Russia resulted in a wave of corruption and stagnation. The arts movement that Surkov came from had a split response to this. Some wanted to use the avant-garde spectacle to inspire the masses, to bring grassroots movements to the center of politics. Others became cynical, and Surkov obviously fell towards the latter. In an interview, he said that the idea of democracy would always be an illusion. For Surkov, the best we could do was to use a strong state to manipulate people, to manage them all the time, so at the very least, they can feel free. Surkov's project is pretty unrivaled, but some people have argued that we in the West are slowly starting to see our own brand of postmodern politics taking shape at home. Part 5 the Conservative and Unionist Party. It was 2019. Bedroom pop was a thing. In the UK, the Conservatives closed the decade by winning a landslide victory against Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. Many have argued that their campaign was one of the most dishonest in modern history. Now, I know all politicians are dishonest, and it's not just conservatives, but there is one thing that changed here. Traditionally, Western politicians would use the technique of spin. That is, using facts, figures, and news stories which are generally truthful, but are arranged in a way to frame a narrative. In 2019, the approach of the Conservative Party was just to lie. Following the election, a study found that 88% of the Conservatives' most promoted ads were flagged by independent fact-checkers as not correct or entirely incorrect, compared to 0% for Labour. The Conservative press office disguised their Twitter account to look like an independent fact-checker and then used it to launch waves of spin and attacks on the Labour Party. When the Labour Manifesto was released, the Conservatives launched a website of their own with the very suspicious URL labourmanifesto.co.uk. Then, they bought several ads to push their site to the top of search lists, eight of which had to be banned because they violated Google's terms around the listing of fake documents. 
The Sun newspaper, which openly supported the Tories, published a headline which claimed to be an expose of Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party's links to left-wing militants and illegal terror organisations. The article was presented as breaking news, but was soon deleted after it emerged that the chart they had used had actually come from a website called Aryan Unity. And none of this is to mention the Conservative Party leader, who was once fired by his own party for lying about an affair, fired by a newspaper for inventing a quote, and who once went to court for lying to his wife about an affair which resulted in an illegitimate child. Part 6. Conclusion I mean, that last example aside, you could maybe see the Tories' efforts as a kind of noble lie from a bunch of establishment boomers with a very sincere red scare, but I don't know. Doesn't it feel like the lies tend to get a bit less noble over time? Lying about people being infused with metal, that's kind of brilliant, but is blaming poor people for economic hardship really for the greater good? Is turning political discourse into a literal circus so an ex-KJB officer can stay in power for 20 years really for the greater good? Publishing propaganda from a neo-Nazi website for the greater good? When I read that Washington Post fact-checkers had recorded the 13,435 lies Trump told since becoming president, I just wondered, how long did that take? They even made a chart. But if you're a hardline conservative, one might say, a fascist, then lying isn't just noble. In a democracy, lying is a brilliant way to waste your opponent's time. It controls the conversation. It forces the people trying to correct you to speak on your terms. If I can give my own pseudo-intellectual take here, conservatives lie because they think it is just. Fascists lie just because. But what I'm more concerned with here is, what exactly does this say for the people who believe them? Remember when Blair White did that video exposing a bunch of conservative goons for lying about the positions they held and no one cared? Before the 2019 election, a Tory voter on a call-in radio show famously accepted the position, Boris Johnson is a massive liar, but he's my liar. Plato, Burke, and Hayek all spoke about deception as something that happens more or less below the radar, whereas lying today is done in broad daylight, with the full approval of supporters. This is where you are as a conservative supporter. This is what they think of you. They think that you are too stupid to know what's best for yourself or for society. And they're happy to tell you that because they know you'll support them anyway. They hate you. Okay, I realize I'm a bit off the point now. Like, what was the point? Where am I going with this? Hey, hey, Lorna Box, are you not just overthinking the very simple fact that conservatives lie because they have neither the natural nor the social scientific reality on their side? Yes. <laughs> <laughs>